Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Safe Cities. And um, I trust that you had a wonderful holiday, that you are refreshed, and that you are ready for some wonderful word of the Lord this year. Amen. I, I pray that you are all safe and healthy. And um, I uh, believe that we are going to have some fun in the word of God this year. And as a spiritual family, that you are really going to dig deep into the word of God and that you will um, be immersed in his grace this year. Let's just pray before we start this evening. Father, we thank you. You are almighty. You are gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. We thank you this evening, Lord, even as we can lift up our hands as an evening sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that you are the beginning and the end. You're the first and the last. You are the Alpha and the Omega. And you are our protection. You are our fortress. You are our rock. We thank you this evening, Lord, for your grace, for your um, for your loving kindness. We thank you for every good and perfect gift that comes from the Father above. Oh, we thank you for your word this evening, Father. Your word is our light. Your word is, um, your word is a lamp to our feet um, and a light to our path. We thank you this evening, Lord, that forever your word is settled in the heavens. And we thank you, Father, that you use your word to give us direction, to discipline your church, to, to make your church straight, to bring us to that place that you want us to be. This evening, I pray, Father, that you will um, speak to us. Let your spirit speak to us, Lord. Um, let us hear what your spirit is saying to the church. Open our ears, Father. Remove every blockage. Remove all the wax. Remove all the obstacles that prevent us from hearing your word so that we can come to be that nation, that holy nation, royal priesthood, that company of people, that son that you are raising on the earth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I welcome you again this evening and all those who have not yet connected. I see they're a bit slow to come online this evening. And um, we have, uh, we had a wonderful year last year, although our ministry is not based on chronological times and years and New Year's Day and things like that. But um, we, we have to take cognizance as well of God's creation. And, and this is God's creation. Uh, chronological time is also God's creation, although he does not operate in our time, but he has created us like this. Now, um, we, the last time that we were together, we spoke about the enemies or the giants of the promised land, and we looked at those seven mentalities. That was during our first fruit week, the seven mentalities that you must overcome to enter into your dominion or to enter into your promised land. And we're going to uh, revise those again later on as we um, coming closer to, uh, to this, uh, closer to our destination, uh, where the Lord wants us to be, the, the manner that he's giving us. And I want to say to you that I cannot see it all in advance. Um, I'm also just taking a day at a time as I'm hearing the Lord and preparing manner for you and um, preparing the word for you. Uh, I get excited because there's certain things that the Lord is showing, but he doesn't show us far ahead. And so be patient with me. Sometimes it's difficult to articulate certain things. There's certain things that we suddenly see while we're speaking. Some of you would know, some of you who are teachers of the word of God, you see something while he's speaking and suddenly that changes the course or direction of the, of the series that we're dealing with. So be it. We are seated at the table of the Lord. We're here to feast with him. We're here to enjoy this meat that he's giving us, this wine that he's giving us, this word that he is filling us with, his word and his spirit. Amen. So I want to speak to you this evening about lifting the standard, lifting the standard. As I've already spoken to you recently, we are chosen to be kings and priests, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. I said to you that Jesus came to have life and have it more abundantly, but we are still, uh, we still have mentalities um, and we still live menial lives and not operating with dominion. We're not getting to that rulership that God wants us to get to. We still live under the curse. We still live in conflict. We still live in poverty. We still live with disease. And our mindsets have to change to have dominion. And those are the giants of the promised land that must be obliterated. So from the 12 spies, um, that we studied previously, who went into the promised land, into Canaan to go and spy out the land, 
only two of them presented the standard. Now, to have dominion, we must raise the standard. Now, remember, we spoke about this before. Isaiah 59 says, when the enemy comes in like the flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. I said to you in the Song of Solomon, and this is actually where we got stuck and we're still stuck there, um, where the Shulamite women sing and she says that um, his banner over me is love. He standed over me is love. And we came to the conclusion that God's standard is love. And that standard is a banner. It's a banner of our lives. And that banner cast out all fear. The Bible says perfect love cast out all fear. So when you come to your promised land and you, and you are faced with enemies and giants, you cannot run away because of fear. That's an escapism mentality. Now, I submit to you that the majority of the church are fearful. The majority of the church fall under those 10 tribes. They want to run away. They want to escape. They want to be raptured. They want to be delivered from the enemies. But God has given you the strength to overcome your enemies. So again, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. There is a flood of enemies coming your way. But there's a standard in you. You are a son of God and you have the spirit of God in you. You have the word of God in you. And that standard, God will lift that standard up against the enemy and block the enemy from attacking you. You can also read that scripture in another way. Remember that in the original scriptures, they, there's no punctuation because it's Hebrew. So it says, you, you can read it this way. When, a, when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. So if we move the, the words around a bit, when the enemy comes in, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him like a flood. So in other words, that standard becomes a flood against the enemy. <laughs> okay, the enemy cannot flood you away. You will flood the enemy away. So now you need the word of God. You need the flood of the word of God. You know that the word of God is a picture of water is a picture of the word of God and we have been seeing some floods recently here in Lady Smith very um rare that we would see a flood there but it has been flooding in places that we cannot expect prophetically that means there's a flood of the word of God coming and that will obliterate your enemy so you must lift the standard in your life and this year lift the standard of the word of God in your life so that you would stand against the enemy now these two spies were successful. They had dominion. The others all died in the wilderness. These two were Joshua and Caleb. I want to look specifically at Joshua as a standard. I want to look at Joshua as a blueprint. I want to look at Joshua as a yardstick. For us to understand how we're going to lift that standard in our lives. The name Joshua comes from the Hebrew name Jehoshua, meaning God is deliverance or God is salvation. It's the same name that, Jesus, uh, that the name Jesus came from. And it means, Jesus means savior. So Joshua also means savior or God is deliverance. God is savior. And in the Old Testament, Joshua was the Israelite leader who succeeded Moses and led the Hebrews to the promised land. So the word Jeshua is derived from Yeho, Yeho meaning God, and Shua meaning Savior. So Jesus also means Savior, or God is my Savior. Now, God promised Abram that his descendants will dwell in the land. And under Joshua, God brought the people into the promised land. This completed the mission of redemption that God started with Moses bringing Israel out of Egypt. Remember, Egypt is the world. It also points to the ultimate redemption that Jesus brings. So God chose Joshua to lead Israel after the death of Moses because Joshua showed that he had faith in God. This is very important for you to understand. The reason God chose Joshua is that Joshua showed that he has faith in God. So the first standard 
and there are several aspects of standard that we're going to, and there's different standards that we're going to speak about, okay? Um, these are not uh, standards as in the one is higher than the other. These are all standards that's lateral and for you to raise the bar or for you to lift the standard in your life, you're going to have to incorporate all these issues. And the first thing is Joshua. Joshua was chosen because he showed faith in God. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 8 that the end of your faith is um, the end of your faith is a salvation of your soul. The end of your faith is the salvation of your soul. So the church is mainly familiar with beginning faith. We can, we can quote all the scriptures about faith. But there is also the position of finishing faith. And when you come to the end of your faith, your soul is saved. Your soul is your will, your mind, your emotions, your thoughts. And all of us are on the path of sanctification, of salvation. So salvation is not just a born-again experience. It also incorporates... Um, uh, Holy, holiness. It also incorporates um, sanctification. And that is the salvation of your soul. Okay, your spirit is saved when you have a born again experience. But then there is the salvation of your soul during your lifetime. As you're studying the word of God, your soul is being saved. Your mind is changed. You're beginning to have the mind of Christ. And at the coming of Jesus, the literal coming of Christ, your body will also be changed. So I hope you understand these things. These are very, very important apostolic truths. And you need to go and revise that over and over as we're speaking these things so that you can understand. So the end of your faith is the salvation of your soul. So faith never ends. We must add to your faith. The Bible says we must shift from faith to faith. The Bible says add to your faith these things, virtue and all these things up to perfect love. Okay, so faith, the end of your faith is the salvation of your soul when finally you have the mind of Christ. And at that point, the Bible says, when you see him, you shall be just like him. So the first standard is salvation. Joshua is salvation. Joshua is the first standard. This is the standard that you must raise in your life. Psalm 78 says, um, it's, and this speaks about Israel. Um, let me just put this in perspective by reading this Psalm 78. I think we did cover that before when we looked at the enemies. Um, the Bible says they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their heart by asking for food of their fancy. I think that's where the concept comes from, fancy foods, Okay. They asked for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Therefore, the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger also came up against Israel because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. They did not trust in his salvation for them to come up against um, God himself because God promised that they're going to enter into the promised land. God already said that they're going to obliterate all the enemies. So they did not have faith. So it's important for you when you come to the Lord to believe that he is your salvation. Amen. He is your salvation. Psalms 27, this one says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 62, verse 2 says, <clears throat> he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. So we see God's great salvation and deliverance during the time of Joshua. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Joshua 10. Joshua 10. And 
I want us to look at something very significant during the time of Joshua and how God showed us a symbol of his great salvation. And this was prophetic, but this is phenomenal. This is phenomenal. And uh, it is, and every time you see this prophetic thing, you will remember the salvation of God. Joshua 10 verse 7. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord rooted them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makeda. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Horon that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Joshua? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there has been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Look at this, it's just amazing. And the Bible says, then Joshua returned and all Israel go with him. Isn't this amazing? At the voice of a man, Joshua ordered the sun to stand still and the moon to stop. <laughs> now you would say, but the sun is standing still. It's the earth moving around the sun and the earth is moving on its own axis simultaneously and moving around the sun. But to us, it looks like the sun is moving because we, we observe the sun rising and the sun setting, but it's actually the earth moving. I want to read this to you, a report from NASA. And um, I'll make this, uh, these articles available to you on request. Uh, but let me just read this. Using astronomical data from NASA, the Israeli researchers from Ben Gurion University said the miracle of God making the sun stand still could be due to a solar eclipse that also took place on the 30th of October, 1207 BC. It was during that time when the Israelites are believed to have entered Israel and defeated their foes. So they entered the uh, Canaan, the promised land. But since the sun temporarily disappears from view during a solar eclipse, how could it linger in the sky as described in the Bible? To resolve this contradiction, the researchers took to Hebrew etymology according to the times of Israel. The researchers said the Hebrew word dom, D-O-M, translated as stand still in the passage actually means to become dark. So the sun didn't stand still, the sun became dark, which would describe an eclipse. So Joshua prophesied an eclipse. In coming up for, with this finding, they say they do not necessarily seek to prove that everything in the Bible has scientific basis. Um, but at the same time, um, they are looking at a scientific basis because we have to use science also to prove uh, these findings and it's possible to do so because God is the greatest scientist. Okay, he's created, he is also God of science. So it's interesting to understand that at this time when Joshua prophesied for the sun to stand still, what actually happened was 
that there was a solar eclipse. Now again, we see this at the crucifixion. NASA has historic maps of a partial lunar eclipse that occurred at the crucifixion in AD 33. And this lines up with Matthew 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is God, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that time, the darkness over all the earth, the ninth hour, that was a lunar eclipse. At your hour, remember what happened on the cross? Jesus um, redeemed us on the cross. There he took all our sin upon himself. So he was made sin for us. And at that point he was separated. Although he is 100% God, he took on our sin. So he stood in the gap for us. And at that point he experienced our separation from God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was during the time of a lunar eclipse. This was prophesied in the prophet Amos, Amos 8 verse 9. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark in broad daylight. Joel 2:31. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So even in, uh, even in Isaiah 38, verse 8, Behold, I will cause a shadow on the stairway which has gone down with the sun on the stairway of Ahaz to go back 10 steps. Okay, this speaks about the healing of Hezekiah. Let's leave that for, for another day. Okay, but now with regards to the eclipse, Total lunar eclipses, also known as black moons, occupy the skies above Jerusalem five months apart on the 5th of May and the 29th of October in the year 68 AD. A month later, on the 9th of June, the first amongst God's chief enemies, uh, the Roman Emperor Nero, also known as the Beast, commits suicide. As a result, Rome descends into chaos while rivals vie for power. And I'm reading this to you from the works of um, the works of Josephus. Okay, you can go and read that. Wonderful explanations of what happened in AD 70 at the destruction of the temple. He says, meanwhile, General Ves uh, Passion orders his forces to withdraw from battle in Jerusalem, giving Christians another opportunity after the first to escape to the mountains as Christ commanded 35 years earlier in Luke 21 verse 20. A partial solar eclipse was also seen in Rome and Jerusalem a year earlier on the night of 31st of May in 67 AD, the day before stones weighing a talent pelted Jerusalem with immense the second and third and fourth bowls of God's wrath were poured out on the apostate city. And that's the city of Rome. In addition to the aforementioned black moons and solar eclipses, historians record the appearance of armies of angels, a sword-like star, a high for giving birth to a lamb, and the sound of superhuman voices in Jerusalem before its destruction by the Romans in 70 AD. Now, this is phenomenal, um, that even these scriptures, these, these prophetic scriptures that we read in Joel 2.31, Amos 8 verse 9, speaking about the sun and the moon, are, are referring to not just the historical time in Joshua where we see the eclipse. It's prophetically referring to when Jesus died on the cross and then again at the coming of the Lord. And again, um, the first there were several comings of the Lord already, um, but in AD 70, and you know Matthew 24, when it speaks about the coming of the Lord, he was not speaking about the literal return of Jesus, 
Matthew 24 speaks about the destruction of the temple in AD 70. That's why you must read the works of, um, of Josephus so that you can understand why that uh, those scriptures in Matthew 24, where he says one will be taken, one will be left behind. He was speaking about the words that Jesus spoke when he said, um, uh, two of you will be, will be, um, uh, will be lying in a bed, one will be taken, one will be left behind. He was speaking about the reality of the destruction of the temple in AD 70, when the Romans uh, come to destroy the temple and how the Christians must, um, must flee to the mountains. And he said, to you, he said, woe to you when you're pregnant on that day, because it's going to be difficult for you to get up to the mountain and Josephus have a wonderful work of explaining what happened during that time the great destruction on the temple and how the Christians were saved because they remembered the words of Jesus and at that time there was also an eclipse so what I want to say to you today Acts 2 verse 20 says the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into black before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. The great and glorious day of the Lord. This can speak about what happened in 8070, but also about your day of salvation. God is going to create an eclipse for you. Whether it's a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse, it's a total eclipse. Let's call it a total eclipse of the heart. That's not Bonnie Tyler's eclipse, okay? Because you are not lonely and hurt and you don't need a man or a woman to comfort you or save you or deliver you in the day of trouble. Salvation is in God. Salvation comes through Christ. That is an eclipse. The total eclipse of the heart is when salvation comes to you. Amen? So the eclipse is a picture of salvation. So now every time that you see an eclipse, uh, I remember even as a child, whenever there's an eclipse, we'll be running outside. Wow, there's going to be an eclipse. And everybody grab the cameras and cell phones. And even now, that still happens. Every time that you see an eclipse, I want you to remember the salvation of the Lord. Amen? The salvation of the Lord. And salvation comes through Christ. There's other pictures of salvation in the Bible, like the sheep gate. Um, the sheep gate is a picture of salvation. That was where the lamb without spot and blemish was chosen. Um, the sheep gate is Jesus also. It's a symbol of the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Because Jesus said, very, very, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Um, so the sheep gate is a picture of salvation. Um, the Ark of Moses, remember Moses was hidden in the basket, or it's also called an ark, um, in the river Nile. It was a picture of salvation. Um, the laver in, in the tabernacle was a picture of salvation. The, the, actually, the brazen laver and the brazen altar were pictures of salvation. The veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place was also a picture of salvation. The veil served as a partition between man and God. And on the day of Christ's crucifixion, the veil was torn in two from top to bottom as an act of God. So it's a picture of salvation. Um, so the tearing of the veil symbolized that the partition between God and man was broken. When Jesus died on the cross, that partition was broken. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 14, he is our peace who made both one. He, he has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So the torn veil symbolized the breaking of Christ's body on the cross. It is this act and the shedding of his blood that gives us direct access to God at any time. And that is what salvation does for you. Okay. Um, then we can also look at the table of the Lord as a picture of salvation. Later on, we're going to participate in communion. It's a picture of his body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed for us, for us 
and by that we have salvation. Then the different feasts of Israel, um, the feast of Passover, the feast of Pentecost, and the feast of Tabernacles, specifically the feast of Passover is a symbol of salvation, a symbol of regeneration. Then we have um, Noah's Ark, which is also a picture of salvation. There's a door on the side, um, which is a symbol of Jesus in our salvation. There's a window, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit in our salvation. There's a triple deck, which is symbolic of the triune Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in our salvation. So salvation is a standard. Joshua is the standard. You must have that eclipse in your life. The eclipse is a standard. And we're going to look at, at many natural things. Um, there's even there's many natural disasters taking place at the moment. There's many natural things in the environment that we don't even um, that we don't even observe. We're so oblivious to our natural surroundings because we are so westernized. We are so modernized. We are living in a postmodern um, environment and society where we're oblivious to the creation of God. We're oblivious to our environment. But when we look at um, our natural surroundings, we cannot deny that there is God Almighty, who is our creator and our savior, and how we relate to him. And the first standard that we have to raise in our lives is the standard of salvation. Do you know how many people go to church and they're not even saved? And I say to you, I know there's many people who's even entered into the apostolic season, go to apostolic churches, call themselves spiritual sons, but they're not sons of God. You cannot call yourself somebody's spiritual son, but you're not born again. You cannot call yourself a spiritual son, but you are not saved. So salvation is the first door. Salvation is the standard. Joshua must come into your life. Salvation must come into your life. Now, how do you know that you are saved? This is a question that many people ask. I would ask someone, are you born again? And the person will say, I don't know. Well, this is how you know. This is how you know that you are saved. Because remember, you cannot be saved without being born again. Jesus said, unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So salvation is only there for those who are born again, born of the war of water and spirit. Okay? So in other words, you are born again. You're born once out of your mother's womb and born again a second time out of the spirit. Both is water because the word of God is, is spirit and life. So the first uh, water is the waters from your mother's womb. The second water is the water of the word of God and the spirit of God. And once you're born again, your womb or your life, the matrix of your life is prepared for others to be born again. And that's why the Bible says from your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay, so... How do you know that you are saved this evening? It doesn't matter how long you've been a part of this household. It doesn't matter how long you have been a spiritual son. I want you to evaluate yourself. Are you truly born again? Are you truly saved? Now, the first thing is spiritual conflict. Spiritual conflict. If you are saved, you will have conviction when you sin. You see, there's two people who sin. Let's say the one person steal his pen at work. Um, many, many employers bless their people with stationery and you steal the stationery. You go and give it to your child because school has just started. And the person who is born again but saved will be convicted. He may, act, uh, he may commit the act of sin, take the, the pen and give it to his child, and he cannot sleep that night. Or when he can return to work tomorrow, he has an inward conviction. 
the spirit convicts him of his sin. But the person that's not born again will have absolutely no remorse, no, no, no conviction, and will not feel that internal conflict. So spiritual conflict and guilt arise as a result of the conflict between the old nature, the Adamic nature, and the spirit born new nature when you sin. There's a conflict between the two. These are the two men inside of you, Adam and Christ. The old Adam and the first Adam and the last Adam. The old nature does not disappear when you are born again. Now, this is a very important thing for you to understand. There is a false doctrine preached by many and even celebrity ministers. They are people who are televangelists, teaching this on television. That when you are born again, your old nature are obliterated. It is eradicated. Now, when the Bible says that he makes all things new, he is not speaking about your sinful nature that is removed. The old nature does not disappear when you're born again. The Bible says in Galatians 5 and 17, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Romans 7 verse 23 says, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Galatians 4 verse 6 says, and because his sons, God sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Again, Romans 8 verse 16, because his sons, God sends out his spirit for you to cry out, Abba, Father. I think there was a mistake there. But you go, go study Galatians 4 verse 6 and Romans 8 verse 16, where you are as a son adopted and calling out, Abba, Father but you still have the old nature. The old nature and the new nature are in enmity with one another. That's why the Bible says that in, in the early um, verses of Romans 8, <clears throat> that if you walk according to the flesh, you will die. But if you walk according to the spirit, you will live. <clears throat> so how do I know you are saved? if there is an internal conviction. Like Paul says, wretched man that I am. Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. And many of us get into that situation where we don't want to sin, but we sin. Because the Bible says, if God would mark sin, who would stand? All of us have sinned. There's only one who has never sinned, and that is God. Jesus was the, the lamb without spot and blemish. Jesus never sinned. But you are not God. You are born in sin. And you are on your path of sanctification. So the first sign that you are truly saved is that when you sin, suppose you tell a lie to someone. Suppose you tell your, your boyfriend a lie or you tell your wife a lie. There must be that inward conviction. You must not be able to sleep. Because the spirit of God in you convict you until you are so, uh, so um, disturbed and troubled by your sin that you go and apologize. So that inward conviction is proof that you are truly saved. The second sign that you are truly saved is a God by love. A God by love is like software that's installed. The moment that you are born again, the moment you come to Christ, that is installed. So you download that app and then it must be installed. But sadly, many believers download the app in their life. They say they're born again, but it's never been installed. They're not using it. They're not practicing it. So the love is, the love do not grow. The love does not increase. Okay. So you must love. You must love one another. The Bible says, because your sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. Um, gosh, we, we have this scripture all the time today. All right. First John 4 verse 7. 
Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. The Bible says that if we love God, we cannot see. If, if we don't love our brother who we can see, how can we say we love God who we cannot see? 1 John 4 verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that that we dwell in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he that dwell in love dwell in God and God in him. So brotherly love is proof of your love for God. Yes, the scripture I spoke about, if a man say, 1 John 4 verse 20, if a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he's a liar. If he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that we who love God, love our brother also. Amen? So we love our brother, we love others. We must also love the things of God. Colossians 3. If you then are risen with Christ, seek the things which are above where Christ is. Set your affection on the things above, not the things of the earth. So love the things of God. Don't love the music of the world. Don't love the things of the, God, of the world. A God by love is planted in the believer. And Jesus prayed for this in John 17. He says, I have declared unto them your name and will declare it that the love uh, wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. So this love, setting your affection on the things of God, the same love that Jesus had for the things of God, we must also have. Then we must also love his word. If you love, if you are truly saved, you will love his word. The Bible says as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. I see many people getting born again, so-called born again in the church, and all they love is music, praise and worship music. Because you love music in the world, salvation was easy for you because you come into the church and you're still a lover of music. The beat hasn't changed. The environment hasn't changed. The entertainment hasn't changed. It's only the lyrics that changed. And maybe the art has changed. But nothing else has changed. You're still loving the things of this world. And I'm not against gospel music, but the demand for you, the proof that you love God, is not loving music. It is loving his word. And there's so many people coming into the church loving music, but when the word starts, they fall asleep. They don't love the word of God. The Bible says as newborn babes, and how many times does a newborn baby desire milk? Seven times a day, some newborn babies want to drink milk all day long. And the Bible says, if you a newborn babe, if you're truly born again, if you're truly saved, you must desire the sincere milk of the word. So you must love others. You must love the things of God. You must love his word. And you must have love for God. Romans 5 says, hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit was given him unto us. So if you are truly saved, you will love God. In other words, you will seek the kingdom of God before anything else. Another proof that you are truly saved is that you will have victory. You will walk in dominion. You will have victory over the flesh, victory over the world, victory over Satan. You will overcome Satan. First John 2 says, I write to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one. I've written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. You have overcome the wicked one. They are still young men. They're just born again. They're not yet mature in the word of God and they've overcome the wicked one. If you are truly saved, you will begin to overcome sin. Sin will no longer have dominion over you. 
You will overcome the things of the world. The Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's on in the world. The Bible says, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And I say to you that salvation is by faith. So do not love the world. The Bible says, do not love the world and the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In fact, if you love the world, you're called an adulterer. James 4 verse 4, you adulterers and adulteresses. No, you're not. That the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. If you're a friend of the world, you're betraying God. You cannot be a friend with God's enemy. And the world, the system of the world is God's enemy. You will have victory. You will have victory over the flesh, overcome the flesh. Galatians 5 says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections, with the affections and lusts. Whosoever is born of God has not sinned, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Prove that you are truly born again. In the past, you want to use his hand to sin. Now it's becoming more and more difficult. You cannot sin because you have Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. First John 5 verse 18 says, We know that whatsoever is born of God sin, cannot sin, but he that is begotten of God keep himself, and the wicked one cannot touch him. If you're truly saved, you keep yourself. Man, I know the Bible says that we are our brother's keeper, but you must also be your own keeper. You must learn to keep yourself, keep yourself away from the things of the world. The Bible says don't be spotted in these places. Keep yourself, protect yourself. That is self-responsibility. That's not something that I can give you. A lot of people say, um, when they look at people in our church and people sin, they say, oh, the pastor is not, is not looking after his sheep. It's not my job to run after you and protect you. Jesus said, uh, you need no one to teach you because the Holy Spirit is your teacher. He's not speaking about doctrine and the word of God. Of course, he gave to the church teachers, pastors, evangelists. But there's certain things that I can't teach you. And that is when you're walking down that street and you, once you were an alcoholic, and now you're walking past that tavern or you're walking past that, past that bar and, and, and um, you have demons telling you, go inside, go have a drink. Can you remember what your wife did to you? Can you remember what your boss did to you? Go and have a drink. You must know how to keep yourself. If you're truly born again, if you're truly saved, you have the spirit of God inside of you. He will teach you not to go in there. He will teach you what you must do. In other words, he will lead you and show you what to do. First John 5 verse 18 says, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. This is in the NIV. The one who was born of God keeps him safe and the evil one cannot touch him. The new birth delivers you from sinning habitually. You may sin, you may fall. The Bible says a righteous fall and get up seven times. But you will not sin habitually. You will get convicted. You will repent. You will grow up and mature in the grace of God and the word of God. But you cannot continue sin and sin and sin. You cannot sin, go repent for your sin, and then tomorrow go sin again. Then it becomes a habit. So when you fall, when you sin, it's okay. There's grace and mercy for you, forgiveness available, but self-responsibility. Otherwise, you will walk in licentiousness. God hates licentiousness, where you use the, abuse the grace of God. There are hyper-grace teachers out there who are preaching. Don't worry. God loves you. Just come back to him. You cannot just repent every day. Then you, that is when you come to the table of God in an unworthy manner. And that will bring disease into your life. That will bring calamity into your life. So the new birth delivers you from sinning habitually. 
Romans 6 verse 14 says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. So this threefold victory is righteous living and it manifests in Christ's nature. So if you are truly saved, the first thing is that you have spiritual conflict when you sin. The second thing is that you have a God by love, loving God, love his word, loving others, not loving the things of the world. The next one is that you have victory over the flesh, victory over the world and over Satan. And then the fourth one is that you have evidence of your evidence of your faith, evidence of your faith. First John 5 says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ born of God, everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. So what is the evidence of that belief? If you believe in Christ, you must receive him into your heart. You cannot say I believe in Christ, but you don't receive him into your heart. John 1 verse 12 says, for as many as received him, he gave him the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So what is the evidence that you believe? It is that you receive him. Then you repent. The Bible says, and at times of, his, of this ignorance, God winked, but now command all men to repent. In Mark 1 15, we see um, the Bible says, repent. Uh, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Now, unbelievers cannot repent, you have to come to Christ first, be born again and then repent, because then you understand that you are a sinner. So you first, uh, you first receive him in your life, and then you must repent, and then you must confess. Those are practical steps of saying that you believe in him. You cannot say you believe in Christ, but there's no evidence. The evidence is that you receive him, you repent, and you confess. And confession is public. So you can't be a secret believer. You can't say you believe in Christ, but you don't want your family to know that you're a Christian. Okay? Romans 10 verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you shall be saved. So there must be a confession with your mouth. Don't be like Peter who is a betrayer who denied Jesus thrice because he was scared to tell them that he was with, with Jesus. And there are many betrayers today in the kingdom of God. When you operate in the business world, uh, you do not want people to know that you are a believer. Shame on you. You are not truly saved. And you need to come to salvation. So the Bible says in 1 John 4 verse 15, whoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. So there must be, um, there must be an internal conviction. There must be a God by love. There must be victory, but a victory over Satan, over the world, over the flesh. There must be evidence that you are saved, practical evidence, and then you must do his will. This is how I know that you are saved, if you do his will. First John 3 verse 24, he that keep his commandments dwell in him and he in him, and thereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he gave to us. So how do I know that you are truly saved? When you keep his commandments, the will of God is the word of God, the commandments of God. So if you are obedient to the word of God, then you are truly safe. The Bible says in 1 John 2 verse 3, hereby we know that we know him. Hereby we know that we are saved if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and do not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whosoever keeps his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. So if you are truly saved, you love him. And if you love him, you will fulfill his word. So how are you saved? How do you give your heart to the Lord? 
your heart is just an organ that pumps blood. Your heart is not referred to as that organ. Your heart is actually your mind, the center of your being. And for you to become a Joshua, because now for you to become the standard or to lift the standard, you must become the standard. You must become a savior to others. And I'm not saying that you are the savior. Okay, Jesus is a savior, but you must become a Joshua to others. Lead them into the promised land. And you will not be able to bring them in if you don't become the standard. The Bible says salvation belongs to the Lord. And you belong to the Lord. So you must lift this, this standard. You must raise this bar in your life. Give your heart to the Lord. In other words, allow him to infiltrate your mind, renew your mind. The end of your faith is the salvation of your soul, the salvation of your mind. And it's through this salvation that you will overcome all these enemies of the promised land. Out of 12 spies, only two were born again. Only two had their minds renewed. Only two of them could think like Christ. Only two of them were obedient. These two only had a total eclipse of the heart. So you become, don't worry about looking at these signs um, or uh, evidence that one is born again to, to qualify someone else if they are saved. Now look at yourself. Look at yourself today and determine if you are truly saved. Let this become the moment for an eclipse in your life. And every time that you need deliverance, there will be an eclipse for you. Amen? Salvation for you. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And this is the standard that must be raised in our lives. So today it's coming to the table of the Lord and you can bring your communion elements closer because... Uh, we're just going to take a moment to partake of the table. As you are um, partaking of the table of the Lord today, I want you to remember the works of redemption that Jesus did on the cross. When he died on the cross, his body was broken for us. That is the bread. The bread is a symbol of his body that was broken for us and the wine or the juice is a symbol of his blood that was shed for us and in this is salvation if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth if you believe that Jesus died on the cross and that he has risen and seated at the right hand of the Father. You qualify to partake of this communion. Communion is for the children of God. You cannot come to the communion table if you're not born again, if you're not saved. So it's a, it's, it's a symbol of salvation. And if you are not saved, it's not too late. Tonight you can say, I believe. I receive Christ. I repent. So we take the bread, it's a symbol of his body that was broken, and the wine, a symbol of his blood that was shed. And we simply do this out of obedience because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. We do this every day in our lives. Some people do it several times a day in remembrance of him. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body that was broken and your blood that was shed for the remission of sin. We partake of joy, simplicity, and gladness in our hearts. And at this table, you promise that this healing, deliverance, salvation, grace available at your table. We partake now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll speak to you again next week, Thursday, our second session. 
on lifting the standard. Go now in the grace and love and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Goodbye.